everybody. Welcome to Teal's Roadhouse. Good to have you all with us again. My old friend Mark Wills is with us today. How are you, pal? Man, I'm good. It's good to see you, bro. Good to see you too, man. Thank love you. the love the bus. Love the uh love I you know, you see it on the see it on the different episodes, but didn't know if this was kind of a uh, a mock up. Yeah. Well, this is really the bus. This is really the bus. It's really the bus, man. This is where we live and travel, and and uh, it's taken us a little bit to get all the camera angles and everything, but it's, we're yeah. finally getting her dialed in. Yeah, it looks good. Yeah, it looks yeah. good. I love it. It's got a warm, homey feel to it. You know, there's been a little tequila shot in here, you know. Oh, you think? Yeah. You think? I mean, well, I'm, you you talk about tequila. I got Willie Nelson sitting next to me. I'm not <laughs> no, sure No, Willie that... don't drink, though. Willie just smokes. No, that's what my point. <laughs> you <laughs> said tequila, but I got Willie Nelson sitting next to me. My wife so, don't let me uh, smoke on the bus. Well, you know, it's, it's probably it's better. For the vocal cords, it, it is better for the vocal better for the vocal cords not to do that. So uh, we go way back, man. I mean, we've known each other since the early nineties. It's been years 93? and years. Three. I mean, we, did we meet at the Buckboard the first time? You had you I, had already started your because I did I, I did one of my early showcases at the Buckboard. You did the Buckboard, mm-hmm. and I I didn't I wasn't for I wasn't there for that. But do you remember you came down to Stockbridge and you did a show at the high school? Uh, oh yeah, I you did a show. What that was for. Yeah. You did well. <laughs> you did a show down at the high school, and one of the teachers down there you had you had become friends with, and that's actually where I met you for the first time. Was in '93 somewhere Probably somewhere in that so, neighborhood, yeah, yeah. you know, and uh, and and that's where I met you. And then and you know then like everything else, starting my record deal '95, uh, recording the new record. We run into each other doing rhubarb doing different, golf, rhubarb's golf, golf tournaments, golf, 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 you know, all that kind of yeah. stuff. Rhubarb and Moby and all those yeah. guys. So we, so our our paths had continued to cross. And of course, you knew Darren Norwood. Yes, uh, Darren had been the the lead singer at the Buckboard before I, you know, yes. before he signed his record deal with Warner Brothers and then transitioned to Giant. So there was there was all of that. I think I even think at some point. Y'all were doing something in Atlanta together, like maybe a private show, and you came into the buckboard and kind of hung out with yeah, us. Yeah, we did quite later. a few things there over the years, man. Yeah. Different label events and different functions, but but yeah. uh, it's been uh, it's been quite the journey, hasn't it? It has, man. Yeah. It has. It's good to see you. Yeah. Good to see you. You know, doing well, and here we are. Some. 30 years later, we're, and both of us still standing. We're the elder statesmen now. Yes, we are. We started out as the kids, and now we're the old men. I was always the youngest in the band. Were you always the youngest in the band? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, you think about it. When I was, when I signed my record deal, I was 21. When I, when I started out on the road in January of 96... Doing a radio tour, I was 22 years old. Really, I didn't realize you you were that young. Yeah, I was. Cause I got signed mine at 23, so you were younger than me when you got your deal. Yeah, I was. I was 22. That's a lot. And you know, and all of a sudden, you're you're the boss. You're the you're the 22 year old boss of 12 morons <laughs> running up and down the road. And I say that I say that in a loving sort of way because yeah. we were all wide eyed and just in it. For the experience, it was oh like gosh, it was yes. crazy. Well, and it was an exciting time too yeah. because there was so much great music, uh, so many really good bands. I mean, there yeah. was great musicians, and uh, the camaraderie was so much different back then, man. I think everybody was proud for everybody's success. It's like I don't think people overlapped into each other's lane. You know, everybody right. kind of had their own musical thing going on, and yeah. it was just a really fun, creative time, man. Well, I think I think like everything else. See, I grew up, and and I say grew up. I was, you know, 17, 18 years old, started singing at the buckboard. So I sang a bunch of Tracy Lawrence songs. That were that was the stuff on the radio. Yeah. And, you know, and, and before you sign your record deal, before you are doing your songs, you're showcasing every act that's coming through town that's playing there. So I I got to sing a little bit of everything. Like in today's world, where you're playing down on Broadway and you're having to play, you know, the the top 40 of today. I was getting to play everything from, you know, Gene Watson to, you know, the new stuff like you to uh, to Alabama to Brooks and Dunn to. What was the favorite? Give me your top five favorite artists of the period when you were cutting your teeth that you love to emulate that you thought you did really good representations of. Man, I would I would think I, I don't know. I I feel like you always picked great songs, and that's what I always loved. So I always loved singing your music. I always loved singing Tritt stuff. Tritt was right down the street. Um, I always loved Garth 
you know, because yeah. I'm, I met Garth the first time I came to Nashville when I was 15, 16, you know, something like that. Um, that was, you know, and I always loved Alabama. That's the music, truly, Millsap yeah. and Alabama, that's the stuff that – that I really feel the, like the I've, slicker stuff. Yeah. See, for me, it was like the Haggard and right. the and the George Strait. Right. Those were the guys. And I, 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 did you do this? I remember sitting in my room, man, and I would be listening to songs, you know, trying to figure the chords out. And I would listen to it so much, and I would try to get everything down to the phrasing. I mean, to where they cut the note off, where you took your breath. I mean, that was. I, I remember working on songs so intently like that. Did right. you? Did you do all those things too? I, I probably did. Um, I don't I don't remember it like that because when you're before you have your own style you you know you're you're emulating everything and and, and I wanted to emulate it exactly like the record was right. that was well, my goal Well I remember I remember Alan Reynolds and I don't remember where I saw this interview and I don't remember at what point in my career but I do remember this interview he was talking about Garth when Garth first came in to record his first record and he said, uh, he said, you know, here's Garth Brooks. You know, nobody, nobody knows who Garth Brooks is at the time. This yeah. is 89, probably 88, yeah, 88, like, 89, yeah. something like that. And, you know, and, and he's, and he's, and he's, and Garth's in the studio and, and Alan leans over and hits a talk back, Mike. And he goes, what are you doing? And he goes, I'm trying to do my, I'm trying to put a little George Strait on this. <clears throat> and, and, and Alan says to him, says, man, we've, there's already a George Strait. I need Garth Brooks on this record. Yeah. And I literally, I remember that as, as a young act, you know, 92, 93, when I was really starting to develop who I was or my singing style, I, I took a little piece of everything, but I also tried to make it sound like me. Yeah. You know, and, 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 and good or bad, you know, better or worse, I, I feel like I was, I was pretty successful with that because I, that way I didn't have to that way I didn't have to try to always you know match a Travis Tritt kind of yeah, you know I, timber I, or whatever. It was so much for me about developing the chops of, yeah. of being able to have that wide variety of being able to do things whether it was a Travis Tritt or a Hank Williams Jr. or whatever. Yeah. And I I, w I was talking with somebody uh, in an earlier podcast. You know, you think about all the the influences that we have you know, we're able to draw from those things and we're able to emulate them and we're able to develop a style of our own because of the 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 overwhelming different influences that we have. You yeah. know, it all just meshes together. But what about a Hank Williams Sr., man? He didn't have all that stuff to digest from the radio to be able to develop yeah. that. It was just all him, man. Well, I, th I think that's where you saw... I think you can go back... If you go back to, like, there's, um, there's a time frame in there where, like, Ernest Tubb, if I listen to Willie's Roadhouse a lot, yeah, driving, you know, driving back and forth from Atlanta to Nashville, and you'll hear a lot of that stuff. You'll hear some of those guys that that when you know, like Ernest Tubb was really big. There was a few artists that came along that tried to sound like Ernest Tubb. Yeah, nobody there sounds was, like Ernest Tubb, right? <laughs> you, but you understand what I'm saying, absolutely. You know, there was there's and 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 literally, if you listen to some of the Stonewall Jackson stuff. You can, I, I swear, there's sometimes that, you know, Stonewall Jackson, they'll play a record from Stonewall, and I'm like, that's a young Hank Williams Jr. Yeah. You know, there's, there's, there's different things that you can hear in some of those vocals that really just sort of take me to a, to a place of like, dude, that sounds just like a young who, whoever. And, you know, one of the things that frustrates me about the, the day that we live in now, and I, there's so much that I appreciate about the Oh, you and I are getting ready to go down about, an absolute <laughs> rabbit hole. Yep. And we're going to piss off half of the – they all know audience, we're telling, they and we're going to become heroes to the other half <laughs> of the viewing audience. So <laughs> go right ahead, sir. The floor is yours. I, I really believe that we overtune everything. I think we just because hey, we have the technology to make perfect records, There's it no, all it makes everything sound all the same to me. Before there were Pro Tools, we used pros. Yeah, we used pros to come in and actually deliver the goods. We yeah. we did what we did, and. You know, go back to Sticks and Stones. Go back to what, you know, your early career, my early career, Jacob's Ladder, places I've never been. Those type of songs 
We didn't have any of that stuff. No. I recorded on two-inch tape. And if you go back, and if you went back to, like, a lot of the, the old classic records, and could you imagine going in and pro Tool on a Hank Williams Jr. record? It suck all the life out of it. Like, from the 70s, right. like Whiskey Bent and Hellbound, those little imperfections made those records what they were. Well, I, so here's, here's where we are. Here's where we are in 2024. What's the biggest resurgence in music right now? 90s country. Well, vinyl. Yeah. Everybody wants a vinyl, right? Think about how imperfect vinyl is. Think about the pops and the it's cracks the nostalgia and of all vinyl. of that kind of yeah. stuff, right? But but the music that was on those vinyls it wasn't it wasn't perfected. It wasn't tuned. No, it wasn't any of that sort but of it, stuff. But but they did have mixed techniques that would mask things and and kind of well, fl- massage through there. But the masking war- the war- is different than manipulating. But also the warmth of analog tape yeah. compared to digital tape gave you a much wider pocket right. to get that sound across. I remember I remember putting records on when I was a kid. You remember laying the speakers down in your floor and putting your head in between the speakers? My mom and daddy wouldn't let me have headphones. So they'd make me <laughs> deaf. And that's all I, li- I live in headphones and earbuds. And they never come out of my ears these days. But I would lay down and just crank it up because I wanted to hear every little freaking thing man did you yeah. ever, i mean i have those great memories like that. oh well i mean the the first record that i ever had in my life was a conway twitty greatest no record. kidding you i know. think condy I, people get mad at me for saying this too but con conway was one of the nastiest artists dude say some nasty songs don't I, take it away okay here's <laughs> i i Come actually talk about this in my show i love I it talk about this in my show sometimes when, when, you know, when I'm at, when I'll say, hey, what do you want to hear? And, you know, somebody will say Conway. Okay, now I want you to picture this. Picture this in your mind. Picture, like, you or, you know, whoever. Picture your four-year-old sitting, five-year-old sitting in the back seat singing, I can almost hear the stillness as it yields to the sound of your heart beating. Oh, yeah. Bom, bom, bom. <laughs> and that song is straight up filthy. Yeah. When you, when when it gets to the line about as my trembling fingers touch <laughs> forbidden places, <laughs> bom, bom, bom. No mama wants to hear their five-year-old sitting in the back seat singing that. I can remember my mom saying, you don't need to sing that song. Oh, Daddy, I'm like, oh. Daddy didn't even let us, let us listen to Swinging. He said, that's just <laughs> nasty. <laughs> swinging. <laughs> There's a little Little girl <laughs> in our uh, I love his vocal, man. I'm God, so, I love I'm so daggum happy that that he's going into the Hall of Fame. He deserves it. Too, I think man. that I think that what that's, a legend he is. I think that that's where I think that that's where the music industry really needs to to look at itself. I think we need to start doing more of the living people into the hall of fame oh without a doubt so and john can, man you, but guys yeah. like john had such a huge impact on well, think so about, many of think us think about he what it when was when did swinging come out 82 oh, uh yeah it was the early 80s because i remember listening to it on on buses going to to ag shows and ffa trips and stuff when i was like a freshman and sophomore in high school and i graduated in 86 so that was right on that 82 yeah. to 86 window. i think it's i think it, i want to go back to like nine ten years old you know because my sister I remember my sister Amy loved that song, and I remember she was like six, you know, five, six, somewhere in that neighborhood. So, you know, I mean, that's that's where I that's where I put it in my brain. But wow. I'm pretty sure, you know, that's that's where it goes back to, or, or kind of in that area, you know. So I, I love the fact that he's going into the Hall of Fame, and I yeah. love the fact that, you know, that here we are, and 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 we're getting to see. We've been around long enough to see the people that were big influences on us, you know, going into going in to receive accolades like that. Oh, without a doubt, man. And John was one of the great ones. He was one of the first people I met when I got to town too, because I, I was working with James Stroud at the time and and he was he was cutting that record that brought John's career back. And I got to meet John in the studio. Yeah. I, I think I'd cut Sticks and Stones, but I, I was working on my second album of Alibis, and I got to spend some time with John. What a cool experience to yeah. get to know him back then and know the musicians in his band, guys like Joe Spivey. I'm sure yeah. you've worked with Spivey, Spivey over the years. You see know? Spivey all the time. Well, I used to see him all the time when I would go downtown and uh, and see the time jumpers and stuff like that, and I think yeah. all those guys have all those guys have since departed and went and done. Well, Vince is an eagle and, now, you know. Well, <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey, what do you, you got to do what you got to do. He, he said heart. it the other day. He said he said something like, uh, 
you know, well, I never thought I'd be 60 and joining a band. <laughs> so, singing, so, singing cover songs. Yeah, singing cover songs. Yeah. yeah. But, dude, I, that's that's amazing, too. You know? Yeah, you know, it's, it's been amazing. Uh, we, we were products of the early 90s and had great careers. To see what this industry has done, you know, Garth was kind of the pinnacle back then, doing stadiums and the kind of show that Garth was putting on. Now, I, there's a lot of young acts that are filling up arenas and, and amphitheaters yeah. and stuff now. I, it just seems like it's just exploded. The country is bigger than it's ever been. It's a massive format around the world. You know, it's huge in Europe more so than it's ever been. Yeah, and, and and which is funny because have you did you, have you ever traveled over there? Oh yeah, I've done some See, stuff I've over there. See, I've never in my entire career done anything i feel like elvis to a certain degree i've never really done anything but it's outside hard it seems United like States. And, and i would like to go do more and we talk about it every year but it seems like the times that they want to go you go over there and you you take a couple of weekends and you do three or four shows and the money's way down and and you don't not only don't make as much but it's the money you lose over here and the cost to get over there it's right it's you know but but i think it's changing i think they're playing bigger venues i think there's more big show opportunities for country artists and i think Legacy artists like us are, are can get some pretty good traction. Let's put over together. There. Let's put I'd together to a three week European tour. Uh, Germany, Bavaria, they're a huge market. Yeah. Switzerland is a huge country yeah. market. Uh, uh, England is a huge market. Uh, Ireland is a huge okay, country so, market. So who? Me, you, who? Oh, Tracy Bird. Bird. Let's go. Let's take. Dude, Bird. I I was with Bird just a few just a few months ago. Yeah. He's doing and great, man. Sounds yeah. just like he did. I'm with him and Neil McCoy this weekend. Well, yeah. you that Neil McCoy guy? Yeah, you just yeah, he's, yeah, he's keep him out of the yeah. keep him out of the deal. <laughs> but you know, <laughs> I love Neil. Uh, but yeah, dude. I mean, that's that that. It, well, we got and we've got to we got to find. How about this? How about because we got to you know to be politically correct now. We got to have a female act, but it's got to well, be take somebody. Dana Carter. Well, I, well, I was gonna say Leanne Womack. I love Leanne. She's one of my favorite. I love because I'm with Dina Carter tomorrow. Yeah, tell you Dina. Know? I tell Dina I said hello. But I, I would, Dana. I would say because you know some of those, some of those great. Oh, dude, I could listen to the Fool. I could. She's listen, got such a pure, yes. pure voice, man. She I really could listen does. to the Fool like daily for the rest of my life and never get tired, especially when you have it in the in the cans and it's right here and you can yeah. hear those those little. The little the, bitty, you know, little squeak, you know, you don't know. Like Chris Everett Lloyd when she yeah. hits a tennis oh ball. Oh, my God. <laughs> Son. Just if that don't bring memories back Woo. to you. Well, I don't, know, I, don't know what, I don't know what memory it brings back for you. But. <laughs> so who, who out there uh, intrigues you artist-wise these days? What's happening out there currently that, that interests you? Um, are we... Are, artist-wise. Um, are, I'll tell you who... I really like, um, have you met the girl May Estes? I have not met her. May is a girl, uh, a young girl that made her Opry debut uh, with me uh, probably about a year ago. And uh, she loves the music that we love. Yeah. She is a huge, haggard, huge Whitley. Her her bio on uh, Instagram is trying to make my mama and Keith Whitley proud. Uh, great singer. Um, Cody works with a young girl named Tiara, Tiara Kennedy. Um, she's a great singer. I've heard some of her stuff. You know, um, man, there's, there's a lot of great singers out there right now. But I don't like the way the records sound because of what we were talking about a minute ago. I tell you, a record that does sound good, and and I've known her since before she really blew up as Lenny Wilson's new. Oh yeah, record. that yeah. record's a good. Well, record. Well, I'm not. I see. I I wasn't even talking about. I was I was talking about brand new. Yeah, well, I thought that's what you were talking about. Well, I am, but Lenny's exploded so hard. I mean, we're in in 2024 and. 2020, she was out opening for being Justin Moore with an acoustic guitar riding around in a van. Isn't it amazing and how her overnight success took has 10, been, 12 years? Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, I mean, you know, to, for her to, for, to, to listen to her story and talk about how she moved to town and lived in a, lived in a camper, you know, in the yeah. publishing parking lot and, oh, and, yeah. and 
plugged along and did everything she could to get started. And then all of a sudden, you know, here we are. And it's your reigning CMA Entertainer of the Year. Boom. She and, you exploded know, so boom. hard. Exactly. That, so there's a new kid. I don't know if you've heard this kid. I had him on the podcast a while back. His name's Zach Top. Yeah. Dude, yeah, Zach see, is Zach's man. produced by my original producer Carson, Carson Chamberlain. Chamberlain. Carson and yeah. I write together. But I, what I was blown away by him, you know, you talk about really good talent. I sit and I, I listen through some of some of that EP that that several songs. You can hear Keith Whitley. Yeah. You can hear Ricky Skaggs. Yeah. You can hear Daryl Singletary. I mean, prominently, there's little sections where it just jumps out. It's like, wow, he has studied those things in minute detail. Well, see, but he's he's just a really talented. Well, kid. see, you have to be. You have to. You know, the the poster child for ADD. We were talking <laughs> about Leanne Womack, and then you asked me who my favorite. So I went directly to the girls. You know, but yeah. but yeah, I mean, he's he's phenomenal. Uh, Zach's phenomenal. Uh, May phenomenal uh there's so I, I much was going talent. with brand new because yeah. you know that's that's where that's where i feel like our, our saving grace of country is right now because a lot i feel like a lot of the people that are out there right now they're 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 sort they're they're kind of in that world of of auto tune is king world and i feel like we're kind of ready for the resurgence of the music coming back to not being do you that. feel do you feel like that's gonna be like more of an Americana thing? Is it gonna get a little earthier? And you know, I can kind of feel the mood of the country wanting to get back to a place that's less doctored. Well, I would love that. Yeah. I don't know that the kids of today, you know, I don't I don't know what they want. I don't think they know what they want. Well, that's that's a great point. You know, when I when I look at what when I look at what's out there right now, and I and I think about what I listened to as a kid, you know, and and what we were talking about, you know, back at the beginning of this, yeah, we listened to similar stuff. You know, I listened to the Haggard, and I listened to the Joneses, and I listened, but I also listened to Kenny Rogers, oh, and I also Glenn listened, Campbell, yeah, yeah. So so, uh, you know, you know Waylon. All of that sort of stuff culminated in making me what I wanted to do and what I still do. And where I feel like we are right now is that you've got, you know, with the invention of the Internet and with Spotify and with all of that kind of stuff, the way that people discover the music or whatever they're listening to now, I feel like it's just so different. And I feel like there's so many more um influences than than we were ever open to you know i i i just i feel like that i mean uh, yeah i agree when 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 you and i were growing up we really had you really had two ways of discovering music that was either if you had an older brother or sister yep or you had like for me i had older cousins you know, because I was, you know, was, or the radio, right? And the radio. That's yeah. what I was gonna say. You had your older, your older family members, and the radio. And you know, today you've got people that are listening to stuff that have millions of streams that's never been played on the radio one time. Oh yeah, and and that are packing arenas, right? Yeah, yeah. With with demos, with 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 um, what we would have considered when we were cutting our first records. Board tapes, yeah, you know, boom, push record on a boom box and record it, and here you go. And now you've got, oh, by the way, here's a hundred million streams off of that song, and you're like, what? I, that was the thing for me that just sort of blows my mind in our in our world today. That I always loved the taking the song and going in and perfecting the song. And recording the song, going through getting, the evolution, of getting it. the best vocal yeah. on the song that you could, and getting everything, you know, making everything perfect. Because to me, that was the art and that was the craft. And today, it's almost like people don't want that. And and I can tell a difference too. Uh, at least me personally, there's something about taking a song, you know, going through the infancy of writing a song, getting the idea, hammering a song out, whether you do it by yourself with co-writers and everything, going through the demo process, getting a section of players together and going in the studio instead of piece mailing it out to all right. these people going in because you never know what's going to be 
something that's going to flip the switch with one of those players in there, and they're going to come up with something amazing that really changes that from a good record to a great record. Yeah. And it happens all the time. But having the best players in the world sitting in a room together, focusing on what you bring to the table to enhance it and make it the best it can be, there's magic that happens in those situations. I've heard you talk about songs that you wish you'd recorded, yep. and you talk about 19-something. Yep. And, we're, and as we're talking about that, that – what you were describing brings me back to the day that we were recording that song right over there and you know uh in the in the church on music row i think it's called ocean word yeah it's ocean way ocean but, way yeah, yeah the but, church yeah. yeah and and i remember jt cornfloss Rest sitting in there absolutely uh we were we were talking about nostalgia stuff and you know and and he we're, we're sitting there and he goes he goes, you know, what would be cool is to have this, like, you know, like Jackson 5, A, B, C, take it, take it, take it, take it, you know. And, and, the, and, and he just kind of throws that in at the beginning of 19-something. And I would venture to say for the last 20-plus years, you could hear – Moment that think, you get, think, and you're like – and, and you either – and it either goes – Jackson 5, ABC 1, 2, 3, or 19-something. Yeah. You know, it depends on where you are. It depends on, who, you know. So, yeah, I mean, the the magic of the studio is what I always loved. I, you know, come on, man. I mean. Something you, cool about it, isn't it? Well, you know this, because, like I said, because we come from that era of where every, everybody was together. I mean, yeah. man, I, can, I could go back and tell you a hundred stories of sitting over at County Q in Berry Hill uh, with the Hamstein guys and recording demos, singing demo tapes that that were sent to other artists that I would go in and I and and I'm not joking, you know, and I'll say this in front of the camera because I think that anybody that knows the guy would he, you know, and, and he would laugh about it too. Tony Martin, one of the greatest songwriters oh, yeah. of, of what I feel like is is my entire catalog, my generation. But not what you would consider to be a great singer yeah. by any means. And I could, you know, and I remember going in and, and Tony, you know, get a board, uh, you know, a, a boom box tape of like Jacob's ladder. And if you, you know, and, and he would, he hit the G chord. Jacob was a dirt poor farm boy raised at the fork in the road and a clapboard house. You know? <laughs> and I would come in and it was like, okay, here we go, you know. Oh, so I get to write the melody. Jacob was a dirt poor farm but, boy. But you think about Christopherson and those guys. Chris Christopherson didn't make great demos either. Right. Neither did Bob Dylan. Right. No. And they and and well, and you can argue that they didn't make great records. <laughs> no. But 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 there was something special about well, absolutely. I mean, it was just the honesty and the way that it was delivered. It doesn't have to be perfect to strike a chord with people True. out there. And then we come to this day and age after that. Lead Leads me to something that I've been wanting to bring up. Have you seen the? Uh, have you heard the new Randy Travis record? I have. How do you feel about it? I mean, let's let's talk about that with what AI is bringing to the table. Because from what I understand about that whole process, they you know they they've had the guy that's been out singing doing the Randy Travis tribute thing and mm -hmm. singing Randy songs. And Randy's always at the show. So they went in and cut the track, and he he ghost tracked it. He he did the the voice over right. the track, and then they take Randy's vocals from the old records and dump them down into AI, and then it re-sings it over the top of the, what the the ghost singers laid out, and it's Randy's voice with the inflections all mapped in. Right. What does it? What is that opening up for where we're going now, where you don't even have to sing anymore at all? Well, that's that's what I was going to say. See that? I think it's it's a hard line right there because. For somebody like us that grew up with Randy Travis as being one of the voices of our generation, yep. I love the fact that I kind of get to hear a Randy Travis song. Oh, me too. But, you know, but that's not Randy singing. And, but here, here's, 
my, I'm glad that Randy is getting to experience it because Me Randy's too. still that's, that's cognitively what I mean. still there. That's what I mean. And But what about, you know, the first thing I did, I read that article and saw that video and everything, and I sent it straight to Lori Morgan. She hadn't seen anything about it. How great would it be to hear a new Keith Whitley record too? Right. But, but, what, but what kind of power does that get to a label if they own those masters and they can recreate uh, new material from an artist that's dead and gone? Right. Uh, who owns it? Right. I mean, or... Or if, because it's not really them, right? Or, but it's mapped from them. Or if they decide that they want to do a new Tracy Lawrence record, and you don't want to sign that contract, yeah. And they've got this body of works in the right. vaults over at Warner Brothers in right. Atlantic, and they can take and dump them down. Do right. but because there's no contract there, it seems like they would have to do a new a, con, a new contract with well, if you, you're alive. But you, what if you're not alive? You would you would think I guess so. it would be who who controls the estate. And that's that's where that's where I, that's what I was saying with Randy. Like I'm I'm. I'm, I'm beyond like you, you remove the personal feelings away from that because as the artist side of it, we're kind of like, well, that's the, that's the body of work, yeah. you know, but I love the fact of getting to hear a Randy Travis song. Me too. And I love the fact that he's able to hear it. But, but when I, but, but when I know, but when I know that it's a computer that's doing it for him, it's scary. It's very scary. It's like, do they even need us anymore? Well, they don't. And well, it's the same. It's the same argument, and it's the same kind of. Well, it's. It, isn't that what the whole big strike was out in Hollywood uh, that they were talking about with with, the with taking AI and you know and taking and writing writing storyboards and right and, 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 and being scripts. able to put people in movies right right write, write me a hundred pages in this theme right and it'll spit it out in 30 seconds right and it's like then you can go through and tweak what you wrote I mean, it's like there's a lot of that that's it's dumbing down society because it's taking our creativity away from a whole lot of people it's like it's you remember the movie the disney movie wally yeah we're like so close to Wally right now that you know it, it's it's yeah and it's it's it's, it's about scary. to get out of control. Well, it's been out of control. Yeah. Um, and does the general population really even care? Well, you know, I think there's I think there's a large part of us or a, a large group of us that do, but I think that the people that view it strictly as entertainment, I, I don't you know. I guess if so I So what is it, the next thing? Uh, are we going to have holograms on stage? Are we going to create stars in the box and create a voice for them and then just do holograms and people just go and well, get trashed you know I mean? while they watch all that? We, I mean, what's we next? Kinda, we kind of did that. We we kind of did that in a roundabout way when they put Elvis back out on tour and took the band out and the band played and they put Elvis up on the screen and he sang to everybody. I, I, I didn't see that, but I, I can imagine. You know? yeah. I mean, they did that and they did the same thing. Didn't they do the same thing with Michael I Jackson? Think they did the same thing with Michael and Jackson. And they did the same thing, you know, and 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 I don't I don't know that we're at the point of of it being a big stadium tour, but who knows? As technology increases, I mean, it could, could get to the point that it's almost like Willie's sitting right next to you. <laughs> and yeah, it's almost like I know with um, Tracy, I mean, it could be just like that. with uh, with um, Randy Travis was actually part of that. Oh, he was there. So he was it, there. It, I think it almost it. like if that's sort of the most responsible way to use AI as like almost like right. a prosthetic. Yeah, right, and, exactly. And, and that's yeah. why I don't have a problem with that. Uh, but but it's but it's like it's an entry point. Uh, that we can all be comfortable with because Randy's there and he's agreeing to it and he's cognitively yeah. aware enough to say yes, no, yes, no. Right. But what is beyond just getting your foot in the door and, and saying this is what we can do? What just because we can don't mean we should. Well, see, and that, and and I like, I kind of like the what you were where you went with it with a Whitley record. Yeah, because that does. I mean. Do we do we have the ability to take the stems from 
Well, you, you know, could the take old... the vocal of every record that he did and take a Zach Top in the studio, do your best Whitley version of, of your melody through five new songs or six new songs. We're going to make an EP, and then we're going to make a new Whitley record. It yeah. could be done. It could be done really freaking quick. You're just going in with a stunt singer in a band, pick the songs, and then you just put Whitley's vo voice over the top of it. Yeah. It's that easy. That's that's <laughs> where that's where our that's where our world well we've we've kind of we've kind of set that up over the last twenty plus years of auto tuning it anyway. Yeah. Because how many times have you heard from other people or friends, you know, about somebody that would go to a show and they would say, Man, I love the way XYZ sings on the record and then you go see him in the show and it's like not even remotely similar to it well and then there's the other side of it i have a, a very good friend of mine and i'm, I'm not going to mention the name uh that was performing at the bridgestone and uh several other friends that are in the business that went and saw him and they told me that he was lip syncing to the original vocals from the records from the 90s and there were everybody saying how great it was. All the reviews were great. And, and we sat down and talked. He said, I'm really tight lipped about saying this. He said, but I don't think he sang one note. He said it was flawless. Everything was flawless that night. And it didn't just sound flawless. It sounded like the record vocal from the nineties. Yeah. So, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know. I I I, like, I would rather go hear the flaws and the imperfections, and uh, see an artist give me everything that he have has on a bad night, than see it polished up like that. Well, you and I are on you and I are on the same team, because, you know, it's like it's like me right now. I've got a cold. Um, I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go tomorrow. I'll be in you know Dallas, Texas, or Arlington, Texas, and. Uh, you know, and then I'll be in Missouri with Dana. And then I'll be at the Opry. Yeah. Um, I got three shows, and I'm going to sing it with a cold. Yeah. And so people are going to hear me, and and they may go, hey, he sounds a little different. You know, that's I'm a, a human element. Right. That, that, exactly. That we need that. Right. You know, contact with each other. Yeah. That, right. To, for you know, information. It's the same you know? with musicians. Do you remember? Uh, do you do you ever see the clip of Stevie Ray Vaughan playing guitar when he broke a string and he kept singing? And he he, kept he, he he put a new string on it and strung his guitar while he's still playing and singing and tuned it live in the show and never stopped. Oh, no, see, I didn't see that one. Oh, I my did gosh. see. I did see the one where he's playing and the tech comes in and. Puts yeah. one over him, Austin City and, yes, and yeah. he drops the guitar and goes and and never like never missed a beat. I've seen that. one where he restrung the uh, wow, put a new that's string. Crazy. On. But it's like I, when you have killed to be there when you see those things. Yeah. Those are magical moments when there's a true talent there that can just overcome. Just throw whatever. Just throw yeah. it at me. I got this. I ain't worried about it. Well, you know that's. I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fess up right here to. Your viewing audience. Um, I won't. I don't. I don't run any tracks. I don't run any vocals. I don't run anything in my show. Does either. I, I won't. When when people buy a ticket to come see Mark Wills, I want them to hear the guitar player. I want them to hear the drummer. I want them to hear the piano player. I want them to hear Mark Wills. You know, um, it, it's not always it's not always perfect, but I would say more than not, I sound as as close to the record as as I did when I recorded it 25, 28 years ago. I, I feel like I actually sound better than I did as a 22 year old kid because I feel like as we get older, you know, like like Haggard, go back to Haggard's early days, and Haggard's vocals sounded really thin, and then yeah. and then it got you know it got thicker and it got beefier, and you know I, it I matured feel, right, yeah. and I kind of feel like that's how my vocal has done, but I want people when they buy a ticket to come hear music and see the show. I feel like they ought to get the live version of that. You know, we we've traveled and we've done shows with, you know, a lot of a lot of let's just say the new kids. And then we've done, you know, with some of the heritage acts and we, you know, 
I've I've seen it. I've seen it on both sides. I would. I don't ever want to be the guy up there. Uh, I don't. Tracks. I don't mind going out there and opening for an act, and we've done it for a bunch of kids. Go out there with our little old band, yeah. and it's just us doing what we do, and then see a four piece band walk up there that sounds like a twenty piece orchestra. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like, and but I, we can we can hold our own. Well, yeah. let me tell you. Yeah. You know, you say that, and I want to I want to throw props to you on something that you probably don't even remember, but I want to say this was like nineteen ninety eight, nineteen ninety nine. Detroit downtown hoedown. Oh, I remember that well. Do what you? a bouquet of smells came out of that place. <laughs> well, <laughs> Willie know, knows all about it. <laughs> I don't know about that. What I do know is that, you know, we had had like Jacob's Ladder and places I've never been. Maybe I do cherish you, something like that. And we get there and and we're told that you're going on ahead of us. And I was like, what? Why is Tracy going on ahead of us? And they were like, "Well, you know, blah, I don't know. I don't know what the reason was, but that that right there, you and and you went on and completely blistered our ass <laughs> with hit after hit after hit after hit after hit, and and I, I'll you know I have I have that story and the George Jones going on before me in Jekyll Island. Yeah. Those are my two stories <laughs> of like of being horrified to go on stage and play my little songs after somebody went up there and just kicked our ass for you know for sixty to seventy five minutes because I it was it, it was. It was so it was so great in my because I've always been a fan, man. I always try to watch whoever's you know whoever is is headlining that day. I always try to watch. I try to watch some of every show, and uh, and that was that was so it was so cool because you were like, I don't care when we go on. It don't it never mattered to me. Just tell me what time I'm supposed to start. Yeah, I don't care. Yeah, Jones was that way too. Jones Jones would rather open. He'd, he'd rather so he'd get back to the bus and turn Western on or something. He did not care. Well, I played, you know this, because you've obviously done shows with him. I played a show with him in Jekyll Island, and we come rolling in, and uh, I guess that was the days before, you know, anybody really advanced shows. You know who your promoter is, and you know where you're going. So you just get there. And then they're like, oh, yeah, you know. Yeah, there'll be a PA. Yeah, yeah got, exactly. Well, and, and so Ron Simpson, I mean, Ron was our guy, our Georgia guy. And we knew Ron, you know, he was he was great. He was the guy that did Stone Mountain, and we did a bunch of shows with him. So we weren't overly worried about anything. We knew what we were going to be dealing with. We get there, come rolling in. Ron comes up. Marcus, how's everything going? I'm like, I'm good, Ron. He goes, okay, so uh, y'all go ahead and load in. And then George is going to load in, and he'll go on at 5, and you'll go on at uh, 6.30. And I was like, whoa, whoa, no, 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 no. I'm like, uh-uh. I ain't signing up for that. And he goes, yeah, get, that's that's the way he does it. I don't mind George. Yeah, and I'm like, uh-uh, uh, no. And I went over and knocked on the bus, and I'm like, Nancy comes over the door. She goes, hello, honey. And I'm like, can I talk to y'all for a minute? And she's like, yeah. And I come in, and George is sitting right right here, like in his recliner. Oh yeah, watching something on TV. And I said, uh, I said, listen, um, I got a little bit of a problem with uh, today. And, she, and George goes, what's that? And I said, well, you know, they uh, they're telling me that you're going on before me, and that's just not that's not acceptable. And he goes, yeah. I got a football game. <laughs> and I was like, no, no, you're, you know about this? And he's like, yeah. And I was like, uh, and you're okay with that? And he goes, yeah. He didn't <laughs> care. And I was like, well, I'm not, you know, <laughs> because again, I'm going to go out there and play one, maybe two songs that people might have heard. And you're going to go out there and play. Every 50 years of hits. Yes. <laughs> every hit yeah. that everybody's gonna sing every word to. Uh so yeah, dude. I've I've I oh. gotta tell you, I gotta tell you my favorite George Jones story. I, I got George was the first big tour I was on, so I spent a lot of time with him in the early nineties. And there uh right before George retired, George passed in two thousand I can't remember the year that he passed, it's been a while. But it's probably three years or so before George passed away. And Nancy had had gotten had, had 
they were doing some charity project for uh, military or whatever. And I, I met George at Fireside and we were going to do this record together. And, uh, and so I went in and I knocked my vocal out and George was sitting there and George came in the booth and he called me in there and he said, son, I, he said, he said, I used to knock this out so easy. He said, I can't see the lyric and I can't hear anymore. And I had to go through line by line and I'd sing the line for him and George would put his oh, line on there. God. And I spent all that time in the booth with George singing that record. And that was one of the most special things. Oh, I absolutely. Had. How cool is that? To absolutely. get that moment when your hero is, is kind of fragile like that and you get to share that moment that nobody else ever gets. Oh, see, it's but I can awesome. see it in your eyes. Oh, it's awesome. I can see it in yeah. your eyes how much, how special that is yeah. to you. Yeah. Because... You'll and and never get that again. You'll never get it again, and you'll never forget it. No, and that's what that's what's cool. That's yeah. what's beautiful about our jobs. Yeah, is that you know we grow up with our heroes, and and to get to know them as a peer, like yes. what we get to do. Yes, you know it, it's very special. Everybody doesn't get to do that. Well, I was telling you off the you know before we started here, you were telling me about Willie, and I was telling you about my June Jam jacket. Yeah, uh, and you know and and how like you know, my, my jacket kept disappearing and I would, and then there would be a photo album show up and it would have, you know, a hundred pictures in it of people that I was at the exact same place that my jacket was that, you know, they would, they would have. And, and the culmination of a year and a half of searching for my jacket, uh, turned out that the last picture from, my for this June jam jacket, that I bought myself that did, kept disappearing was a Randy Owen photo yeah. in that jacket. I mean, man, if you'd have told, if you'd have told seven, eight year old me that Randy Owen would even have an idea, you know, that I existed on this planet, yeah, I would have been like, you've lost your mind. If you'd have told me that, you know, Ronnie Millsap would know who I was or Kenny Rogers would know who I was or, you know, I mean, any of any of that yeah. kind of stuff, I would have I would have there's no way there's no there was, there was nothing in my brain that would have, you know, allowed me to believe that kind of stuff. When you and, and I love asking this question, when you were a kid and you were dreaming the dream of doing this, what was the dream? Was it the marquee? Was it riding on the bus? Was it being on stage? What, what was the dream when you visualized when you really realized I got a voice and I think I could I could do this for a living? What was your dream? I think my dream was to sing on the Grand Ole Opry. I remember when I was a little kid, it was before TNN was was out there. Yeah. But I can remember um, maybe PBS or something did, you know, maybe ran some Opry things uh, occasionally, or it might have even been when TNN came along. Yeah. But I can remember my papa talking about going to the Grand Ole Opry and uh, you know, and and me being a five, six, seven year old kid dreaming of, you know, maybe even a ten year old kid dreaming of of singing, I I just wanted to sing. Yeah, I, I you know I didn't necessarily want to make records. I didn't necessarily want to have gold or platinum albums. I didn't necessarily want you know any of that kind of stuff. I, I think it was later on that I realized, along with the platinum record comes you know, touring and, and a bus and being on stage and all that kind of stuff. I wanted to sing at the Opry. I wanted to, you know, you know, it's amazing. The dream is a little bit different for everybody. And that's what I enjoy about this so much about sitting down with my peers, young, old, yeah. cross platforms, whatever, and no matter the differences that we have, there's still a common ground of a passion about the music and, and, and those little variations, you know, on the path that we go down, it, it's none of them are the same. They're right. all a little bit different. What was yours? Mine was the bus. I just wanted to be on the bus. I wanted the lifestyle. I mean, that's, I mean, I wanted all of it. Yeah. I mean, from about 12 years old. Well, now you got three of them. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, so yeah. do you just like choose one for the day and go? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just this is more like an RV these days. It's just me and the wife, pretty much. And you know, I've I don't uh, I don't drink and party and do the things that I used to do quite. As I don't heavily. know what you're talking uh, about. So I've I live a much calmer existence at this have, stage of my life. I have never witnessed my, any of that. TL. My, <laughs> my, my wife keeps me on a leash about that long. <laughs> yeah. I remember. I yeah. remember one of the first. 
first shows they ever did with you was part of the TNT tour. You and you and oh, Bird. Yeah. Oh yeah. Up in uh, Indiana, right there, at, right, right outside Chicago, uh, that big theater in Indiana. Nashville, Indiana. Yeah, Nashville, yeah. Indiana. And uh, and man, you know, I I go back to, you know, talk about our influences, talk about all that kind of stuff. I mean, you and and Bird. Uh, you know, Clay Walker, um, Singletary, um, John Michael, John Michael, N Neil McCoy, yeah, I mean, Chestnut, yeah, Diffy, D I absolutely, yeah. you know, I, I was never around Chestnut as much, and I don't know why, but, but, you know, you guys, McCoy, I mean, Neil used to come in, Neil played the buckboard, literally, I swear, he played the buckboard every, Eight or nine he months. He just wanted to dance on the bar. That's well, all it was. And, and, and he did it a and lot. he did it. He <laughs> yeah. did, you know. But, but like, for for me as a kid starting out, and I say a kid, you know, 18, 19, 17, 18, 19, 20, getting my feet wet, man, y'all were, were, were the idols. Y'all were the guys that had it, you know. Yeah, you may have only had one song on the radio, but – you were you were the living embodiment of what that dream was, and you know, and y'all were always so good. It was fun, man. And it was so fun back. And then. that's what I try to remember now. When, as a fifty-year-old man, I'm, you know, I've got these kids that are that are doing the same thing. I try to remember just how nice it was to have to to come in. And have a Tracy Lawrence, or you know, or or whoever it was, be like, hey man, if y'all need anything, you know, don't hesitate to let me know. You know, this is my production guy, this is our LD. You know, let them know if there's anything we can do to help you. I I, I truly I truly believe that that I learned from some of the best in our industry about you know about about just about just being kind and you know we we always tried to be very gracious too if somebody if uh you had a console go down or yeah. an amp that blew up or a piano or something went down i've always never hesitate to ask share anything we have with anybody yep it's not I've, we've run across some people it's not quite that way across the board anymore there's so uh, it's just not <laughs> I, I, I want yeah i'll leave that there man how, how how did your kids do growing up under the spotlight with a with a dad in the spotlight there. Well, they my, do nothing different. My mine struggled a little bit. We I mean, we had our challenges along the way, man, but it's you know, it's it's it it doesn't it's not an easy thing for a kid to grow up in the shadow of your dream. Yeah. I think for I think for Mally and Macy, for both of them, they never knew that their dad was anything other than their dad until until somebody said it. Does that make sense? It does. Like because, Mally had a friend. Yeah. Mally had a, a friend that came over to our house one day, and they were they were good friends until she came to our house. And then this friend, like, put two and two together, and then they changed the way they treat them. Yes, and that's what mine had. And that was that was weird for her. Yeah. Um, and it, and mine got to the point that they really struggled by not knowing if when when they met people that were nice to them, if they were really truly wanting to be their friend or they just wanted something from them. Right. So that, I mean, it, it does come with its challenges. It does. I, I think that, I think the beautiful thing about, um, about the way our family was and the way that we tried to do it was we always tried to make family. And I say family, not, you know, road family, but, but family, family. I, I never moved, uh, I never moved Kelly and the girls to Nashville. Oh, you didn't. You still live in Georgia. Yeah. I, I kept I kept Kelly close to her mom and uh, her stepdad and her dad and stepmom, which meant that all of Kelly's brothers, or brother and sisters, were all there, and their families. And were so there. you had a family network still in place, and I'm sure that right. helped a lot. We didn't have that. Yeah. Here. Well, that's and that's what I was going to say. I. I Hindsight, looking back, I was a genius because I did that. But you know, but 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 my reasoning behind it was they didn't have anything here. Yeah, 
You know, if they if they if they moved here, then it was always going to be running back but and you, forth. But you had kids before, all, wasn't? No, you started. No, see, like, my, but, my but you first, were still living there. You never moved here. Yeah. So 96, 96 is Jacob's Ladder, and ninety eight is when Mally was born. I had the number one song in the country the week Mally was born, and I had the number one song in the country the the week Macy was born. So so both of mine were born, you know, in in right in the middle of everything, um, and so you know, keeping them in Georgia was a blessing for them, but it was a blessing for me too, because I didn't have, you know, they kind of had their life and they had, they were surrounded by Kelly's family. And stability. And the stability of that made life a lot different um, than, you know, than, than being somewhere that they didn't have anybody else and they were having to latch on to something else yeah what's uh what's how long have you been married what's your next anniversary uh 28 28 i'm getting ready to, I'm getting ready to have my 25th would you have ever believed it <laughs> <laughs> you know i i want to say i want to say i was with you i want to say i was with you um somewhere when i met your wife for the first time um I'm trying to remember where it was. She introduced me to her, and um, and I was like, you know, I knew, I knew that, I knew. I'm trying that, to remember. There was some show that we did. What uh, was it? Like a television taping thing that was over in Hendersonville? I, maybe so. I just remember. I remember that. I remember that I saw a, a a look on your face of of being a happy guy. Oh man, I've got a great wife. She's awesome. Yeah. She puts up with my craziness. Well, uh, <laughs> we all as, need that as we as we all do, buddy. You yeah. know, uh, <laughs> listen, listen. Just because I sing uh, some nice love songs doesn't mean I'm always loving. <laughs> you know, we're, yeah, we're a challenge. We, we always have yeah. every every single one of us has our has our challenges, and we all have our craziness, and uh, you know, we all have our we all have our things that that make us who we are. Without a doubt, and you know, and and the beautiful thing behind beautiful thing behind all of that is that in in the craziest of crazy worlds, we find somebody that that puts up with our BS and you know, and and lets us be loves us in spite of ourselves. Yep. That's for sure. What uh, what do you feel like you hadn't accomplished yet? What's uh, do you still hunger to do something more? Is there anything else you want to stick you stick your toe in? Man, I. I still feel like I still feel like I can make great records and sing great songs that that the people of today want to hear. Yeah. You know, um I I feel like I feel like our era of country music fans I feel like they are still wanting great songs i feel like they're still wanting great music and i feel like maybe maybe there's maybe there's enough of the youth out there that want that they love that 90s country that they want some new stuff you know i i want to i want to keep making records i want to keep making music i want to continue to travel i want to play as much golf as i can amen i want to i want to be uh I want to be a better husband than I've ever been because God knows that we can all look in the mirror and say we all weren't the best, you know, husbands that we should have been. Try to be better we, as, I'm, as I've gotten older, that's for sure. That's yeah. right. As we, as we get older, we can say, you know, we're, we're better people now than we, than we, for than sure. we were. Um, I want to – I want to – be the best i want to be a, a the best grandpa that i can be you oh know? you got grandbabies now i well, got a well junior back there he just celebrated his first father's oh day God. wasn't that awesome oh, congratulations. His, little, his little old girlfriend's got three so, kids so he's he's about to be a stepdad i do not have kids <laughs> at all that i know of <laughs> well hers are precious there they're, they're awesome yeah what do they call you Dare Bear. My Dare name's Dare. Bear. Dare Bear. Oh. Dare Bear. Oh, ain't that sweet? Oh. That's so sweet. <laughs> well, you know, my my oldest daughter has a, we just celebrate on Father's Day. We just celebrated my grandson's second birthday. That's so awesome. his so his birthday was on Father's Day. And uh and she surprised us 
uh, two days before that, telling us that we were going to have another grandbaby. So I got my, I got my second grandson on the way, uh, later, you know, at the end of the year, first of, first of 25. So, you know, so, so priorities have changed a little bit. Oh, without a doubt. But, you know, and I, and I told, I told my manager and I told, you know, all of my, all of my people, I'm like, listen. I'm not running around the world doing a hundred shows anymore. I don't, I don't want to No, You know, I missed, you missed, we missed a lot, so much of our kids' lives. We missed so much of, of everything else. Yeah. And, and, and I want to, I want to participate in that part of it, you know, with my grandbabies. I want to go to ball games. I want to do stuff like that, but I also want to to continue to make music. I want to do, you know, I want to. I don't think I ever want to retire. Yeah, I, I feel the same way. I just don't want to be on the grind as much as you know. We're still. How many dates are you doing a year? You know, it it fluctuates. You know, sixty, seventy. Yeah, I uh, want to get down to that. I'm still doing eighty five, ninety. Yeah, and that's a lot. My, I didn't want to work that much this year. And then you get to looking at the dates on the books, and it's like whew, didn't want to work that much. I said I wasn't going to do that after COVID, and then it's yeah. just it's just kind of gotten out of hand. Again. Well, I mean, I would I would do eighty if you know if they if they all made sense. Yeah, but if they all make sense, you know, it, we yeah. It is what it is. Yeah. You know, we say. Because it's feast or say, famine, you worry, worry we say what's less, next going to be. We say less, but then, you know, when it comes up, we're like, okay, well, let's let's do this. Yeah. You know, Craig Morgan is like the complete uh, opposite of that. He's like, I'm I'm only going to do 30 dates this year. And, you know, and then he looks, you know, he looks at his schedule. He's like, I don't, I don't have dates. any dates. Yeah. He's got 80 <laughs> dates. And he's like, oh, I told him I wasn't doing that, you know. Well, then say no. Well, I can't, you know. <laughs> that's, that's the way it is. Well, you got to pay for these buses. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. There you go. Everything costs something. Yeah. So what's uh, what's coming up next? You got new music? You working on anything in the studio? Man, I have, uh, I have done something. Um, I've done something that I always wanted to do. And I can't go into a lot of detail about it right now but what i can tell you is that if you know what's important to me and you know what we um what we discussed a few minutes ago i got to do something that to the best of my understanding has only been done twice in the last 50 years um Got to do something that is uh, it's going to be very special, very cool. and getting to incorporate a bunch of my friends, uh, folks that you know that we have, you know, from this part of the world, 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 getting to incorporate them into uh, into some stuff, very uh, cool. you know, on on a new record, and 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 I've I've also done a new record that uh, I'll share I'll share a couple of songs with you because yeah, I know how you like great story songs too oh yeah so uh i'll share a couple songs with you that i've i've tracked uh we've got another record that's done as well and so we're just kind of once we get this other thing done we're uh we're gonna find the home for for all of it and kind of uh head down that direction very cool so maybe you know maybe there's a maybe there's a new venture for mark wills in the next I'm, I'm talking like Garth now. I'm referring to myself in the third person. Yes, but you know, but, but good job, Mister Gaines. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, that was actually a cool record. It was a great record. You know, yeah, it was. Good, it really it was. It really was a good record. Garth's um, a very talented guy. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But but yeah, who knows? Who knows? Maybe there's a maybe there's a, a new new uh, venture for that, brother. I appreciate you and respect you so much. Thank you for taking a little time for me. I'm so glad that Anytime. you uh, spent a little time with me on the podcast today. Anything else you want to talk about? I, I, have we not? We've uh, talked about everything and everybody. Well, <laughs> and as soon as the mics turn off, we'll talk about other stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, Bubba. Thank you, my friend. Thank Mark you. Wills. <laughs>